Look at it riding a surf. Look at it riding a surf. Poor man's tarpon. Hey guys, Eric with Blue Line Fishing. Welcome back to the channel. Your time's important to me as always. And what we're going to do in today's time is something a little bit different here on the channel. You know, I primarily am focused on bass fishing, put some videos out on pan fish like crappie and bluegill and things like that, but primarily bass. If you guys watch the channel, you know that. But also once in a while, I'll put out some saltwater videos. And that's what we're going to do today. Talk about surf fishing. I've got a system I think will work for you because it's worked for me for years and being able to find fish and catch fish. Whether you're new to surf fishing or you surf fish right now, I'm gonna show you guys the system that I use to consistently catch fish on the beach. Stick around, I think you'll enjoy it. So like I said in the intro, I don't normally do saltwater videos, but I think I've got a system that will work for you guys because it's worked for me for years. It's really simple. I'll explain to you how I do what I do as far as what I'm looking for, what kind of tackle I use, and then what type of lures that I use. I'll say this too, I don't really fish any kind of cut bait or live bait for the most part. Every once in a while I will, but I like to fish artificials because I can move, cover a lot of water, and it kind of equates to how I like to bass fish. I like to power fish, keep moving, find active fish. Same with surf fishing. I like to move and you know keep moving on down the beach, find those active fish that want to bite, that want to feed, and then keep moving. So we're going to cover a lot of water, but I'm going to go through this step by step and hopefully this will help you guys out. Okay, so what should you do first? Well, when you're looking at planning a trip or you're a vacation and you want to surf fish while you're down there, wherever it may be, it could be the Atlantic coast, the Gulf coast, it just, it doesn't matter because you can use this technique anywhere you go. First thing to do is get on Google Earth or some type of other satellite imaging system on your phone, on your PC, and check out the area you want to fish. You're going to be looking for sandbars and then you're going to be looking for troughs on those sandbars, guts. Uh, places where it could be a rip current. Those are the kind of areas you want to key on. So first thing I'll do is scout it out uh, on the internet. And then after that, once I get there, I walk. And I mean, I walk a lot. I cover a lot of beach, a lot of water. I'm looking for birds that are uh, feeding. I'm looking for bait fish that are blowing up, feeding activity, slicks, uh, just anything like that that I can key in on. But with that being said, a lot of times I will find really good areas by just watching the water. Um, I'll show you a piece of footage here. This is uh, one morning I'd walked about two miles and stopped and fished a few space or a few places and uh, caught a couple of fish. But then I found this nice trough uh, that ran out. There was a sandbar and on the right side, you'll notice there's some darker water and that darker water is where it drops off like a little bit of a ledge and it formed an eddy there in an undertow. Well. I caught ladyfish there, which I know ladyfish aren't really a target species, but they're a blast to catch. They don't call them poor man's tarpon for nothing. Uh, and then I caught some Spanish mackerel then too in, in there as well. Um, it was a nice little spot, but this is the kind of one of the kind of areas that I'm looking for is an area uh, where it just has that change in the water. You know, level depth change. You've got a current change riptide, undertow, whatever you want to call it, you've got that aggressive water moving through there which attracts those bait fish and in turn attracts those game fish. So while we're on the subject of things to look for, you know, obviously you're looking for sandbars and troughs running along those sandbars and those drop-offs, rip currents, guts that cut back in on the beach and things like that, but also look for structure. Just like in bass fishing or freshwater fishing, a lot of times these fish or bait fish will key on this structure, especially isolated structure like a rock pot maybe it's a seawall, a small seawall around a beach house, uh, maybe it's some pylons or posts sticking up or something like that. And in this piece of footage I'll show you here, there was a section of jetties that I wanted to walk down and fish I'd never fished before, about a mile and a half from where, where I had to park. And these single posts or these single pylons, and I really don't know what they're used for, were about every 100 or 150 yards down the jetties. Now jetties are a great place to fish, but I was more interested in these isolated pieces of structure. And I'd fished this one, the first one I came to, probably for about five minutes, switched baits because I was using a, 
a topwater bait, switched over to something I can move along the bottom and probably four or five cast in, end up, end up catching this really nice flounder. So it's just another thing when you're looking online and doing a little scouting that way, or if you just see something while you're out there that's isolated structure, um, like I say, in this case, it was this post sticking out there by the jetties, or it could be just where the beach forms a point, just something really different that sticks out. Always be sure to check those out and give them a shot. So before we get into lures and such, and, and, and what kind of artificials am I using, um, I'll let you know that whatever type of tackle you want to use as far as medium heavy to heavy gear, and I mean like what you use at home for bass fishing, is fine. Like behind me here, this is a quantum vapor reel. It's one I use for bass fishing, a Daiwa Laguna medium heavy seven foot spinning rod. Um, you can use bait casting gear. The only bad part about bait casting gear sometimes is um, a lot of wind coming off of the beach there, coming on shore, and it's tough to cast that bait casting gear um, into the wind like that. Don't have those problems or issues with, with saltwater gear. I don't run real heavy line on it. I've never found a need to. Um, I'll use anywhere between 10 and 14 pound monofilament or fluorocarbon line on it. I do run a, a heavier leader, so I'll run 30 to 40 pound uh, monofilament or fluorocarbon leader. And if I'm using braid, I will. If I'm using braid, I will use an FG knot. Um, and if I'm going, you know, mono to say a swivel and then fluorocarbon, that's how I'll run that. So you can do it either way, um, but there's no need for uh, just big heavy gear. I mean, unless you're targeting like Jack Curvell from the beach or something like that. Uh, I have found that most species that you catch off the beach, you know, we're talking redfish, blues, Spanish mackerels, speckled sea trout, things like that. You don't need that, that big heavy gear. I mean, if you've got a nine or 10 foot surf casting rod and you're gonna run a big plug on it, that's great. But that's not, it's not something I do. Now, one thing I do do is though, I always carry three rods with me, and here's why. Uh, number one, I'm gonna go over the techniques that I use, and all three of these rods are gonna come into play. But the biggest thing is, too, if you have a rod or a reel, um, say, you know, break a rod, lose an island on a rod, have a mechanical failure on a reel, you still have a backup rod and reel, and then if, you got, if you're carrying three, another backup on top of it. I've had times where I've been down to my last one. Um, so it just, it doesn't ruin your trip. If you're three miles down the beach and that's a six mile round trip walking back, you're still able to fish and continue to enjoy your day fishing because you're not out of a combo to be able to use out there. So to kind of expand on when we're talking about tackle rods and reels, um, like I said before, I just use usually 10 to 14 pound test. Uh, you can use braid too. I've got some where I'm running say 30 pound braid. Um, on it, but irregardless of that, when you use your leader, I, I like a 30 to 40 pound leader, uh, either mono or fluorocarbon, I usually use fluorocarbon. And if I'm running braid, I'll tie an FG knot to it. If I'm running, uh, just say mono on the main line and a fluorocarbon leader, I'll use a swivel. I know a lot of guys don't like to use a swivel, but um, I don't mind it. I don't, as long as you don't reel it through the eye, uh, the, uh, the rod up there, you're fine. Um, I know some guys too will likes to attach a snap swivel. I don't like snap swivels. Uh, I think it completely alters the action of the lure, whether it's a gotcha. Um, I was showing you the mirror lures. Guys can say what they want. It changes the action of the lure for sure. I have been out there fishing where we've tried to use snap swivels, for example, on a gotcha or something like that to switch out colors or switch out baits real quick. And uh, we'll one guy, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, Scott Brown, who's been on the channel before, we were down there last year, and at one point, I had a leader that got blown through, put on a snap swivel to try and make it quicker to switch out some baits, and he was still fishing a direct tie on the blade jig he had. He was out catching me five to one, and I, I guarantee you because it changed the action of that bait, um, and I don't care what kind of bait it is. But anyway, that's kind of my little rant on snap swivels. Not a fan. They have their application, but in this, it's not. I usually almost always direct tie to the lure. I know some guys too will say, hey, you got to use steel leader when you're fishing for Spanish, bluefish, and things like that. Steel leaders are great, but I'm a 100% believer in if you use, say, a heavier fluorocarbon leader, 30 or 40 pounds, you're going to out catch somebody, for example, on Spanish for sure. Um, I, I think it's about an eight to one ratio. For every eight fish you catch, they're going to catch one if they're running a steel leader. Because I, I think a lot of times a lot of these fish are leader shy, especially when they got a big steel leader on it. 
Are you gonna lose some fish if you're running a mono or, or fluorocarbon leader? Absolutely are. It's gonna, bl I have one morning down there where I blew through probably four or five baits because the line was getting cut. But man, I was getting bit on every other cast. And you say, well, you need to throw a steel leader on. Well, I put a steel leader on it. As soon as I did that, the bite ceased, took the leader off, direct tied onto the mono or the fluorocarbon and start getting bit again. So, and I've had that happen time and time again because I've experimented with it, experimented with it um, too many times to count. So I'm a big believer in if you can not use a steel leader, do not use that steel leader if you can at all get away with it. And uh, you're gonna catch more fish than the guy standing next to you. So the next thing I do is I pack all my, my lures and my gear in a small backpack. I used to carry a bigger backpack. I don't anymore because a bigger backpack, I just kept putting more and more stuff in it, kept getting heavier and heavier and you know, just bulkier and bulkier. So now I just use a small backpack. Um, I have the lures in it and the gear and tackle that I want to use for the day. It keeps it light. So I've got my small backpack, I've got my, my three rods, and I'm going to explain to you how I rig up those rods as far as what I have on them. Okay, so at the beginning I talked about a system. So we've talked about kind of doing the scouting and then looking where you want to fish and then what kind of tackle we're going to use, just basically a medium heavy to heavy bass fishing gear and a light backpack to put everything in so you could stay really mobile, cover a lot of water. And then I talked earlier about having three rods. Well, the reason I have those three rods is because I like to fish in a, in a system, if you will. So when I get to a spot where I see activity, I like to start on the surface. So one rod I have rigged up with a surface lure, one rod I have rigged up with a mid water column lure and one rod I have rigged up with something that's going to be either bounced or moved along or near the bottom. And I'm going to show you those lures that have really produced well for me over the years. So we'll start from the top down. So one rod, I'm always going to have some type of top water lure. This is a uh, head and one knocker here and there. Um, I like this one a lot. You can use any kind you want. I'd use some kind of walking bait or like this, a popper right here. And this is another head and bait. It's just a simple popper. Actually, this one right here is one that I just had uh, for bass fishing, but I put some little bit bigger hooks that were on it. It's been fantastic for uh, blues, speckled trout, redfish, you name it. The same with this. But so I like to have one, like I say, that's rigged up with top water. You can put whatever kind of top water bait you're comfortable and gives you confidence with. Um, i be honest with you, when they're feeding on top, I don't think it matters a whole lot. You just got to have something that you can get out there with some casting distance and that you feel confident in using. So second is going to be something you can run in the kind of mid water column. My favorite bait of all time is the gotcha. And that that's a gotcha. This is kind of a knockoff of a gotcha. It's called a, it's made by tsunami. It's a zigzag pro. This is an ounce. This is seven eighths of an ounce. Some of the gotchas are seven eighths of an ounce too, but that's around the size I like because you can get good casting dis distance with it. They're easy to work. If you've never worked one of these, it's just once you cast it out, it's as fast as you can move that rod tip. I would change your cadence sometimes to a bunch of quick pops, maybe long sweeps, see what the fish want. But this will let you cover a ton of water. And people think of this bait just for Spanish mackerel or bluefish, but I have caught trout, redfish, flounder, you name it, all kinds of species on this gotcha because it just represents a small moving bait like a glass metal, for example. So a gotcha is one to have. Also some type of diamond jig or blade bait. You can see this one right here, uh, just had down there and we had one day down there that we caught a little over 70 fish and I would say that 80% of them came on this, this blade jig right here. You can see it's bent and the reason it's bent we really got into the blue fish and the Spanish and they literally, it's a lead bait, but they bent that bait and have that happen all the time. Like a lot of times they'll crush in the sides or, or bend these gotchas up real bad. But a blade bait, the only thing I'd say when you get a blade bait like this, and I'll leave some links down in the description below for all these baits. So you can check them out. I'll leave some Amazon links for you, but I would replace the hooks normally on them because they come woefully undersized. So I'll usually put a little bit bigger split ring on it and a bigger hook. Like that's a number six. Uh, extra wide gap treble hook off the back, or you could put a single hook on it. It just depends on what you like to throw, but I would change the hooks out on them. Also, this is a diamond jig. This is a one ounce diamond jig and it gets its name because if you look at it kind of head on there, it's got a uh, kind of a little bit of a diamond shape to it. But anyway, this is one that's got great casting distance as well. You can run it mid water column. I mean, you can really burn it run along the top or near the bottom as well, but it's, it's one I think more suited to running in that mid water column. Also, when we're talking mid-water column, this is a mural lure, so it's 
basically just like a little crankbait that suspends. You can get them to suspend, that sink, that float. I like the suspending ones, and you're going to run that once again mid-water column. I found that the stop-start technique with it um, is best. Change up your cadence, let the fish tell you what they want, what they like. But that's a mirror lure, and uh, you'll catch all kinds of different species, everything from trout and redfish to, to flounder, you name it, and everything in between. And then finally, we talked about a bait that you can run along the bottom. Uh, this is the Slick Lure. This is the Slick Lure Junior. This is the Slick Lure, um, the, the, the standard size, I guess you'd say. It Really what it is, it's just a soft plastic bait that if you bass fish, it's like a fluke, except it's kind of round and bulbous here, has a belly flap on it, and you can run it several different ways. You can rig it up like I have this one, uh, weightless, with a uh, extra wide gap worm hook. You can do a belly weighted worm hook on it, extra wide gap hook. You can just put a jig head on it and use it like that. While I was down there, um, I caught several flounder with this and trout. Um, also end up catching, you know, lady fish and some byproduct fish like that too. But it's a great little bait. As far as something to run along or bounce off the bottom too, just something as simple as a three or four inch curly tail grub with a quarter to three quarters of an ounce, depending on your, your, your current, your tide head on it and you can just bounce that along the bottom or run it near the bottom. And a lot of times that'll pick up your trout, flounder, uh, redfish, and things like that as well. So back to summarizing, we're gonna get online. First thing, look and scout that area you want to fish. Then once you get there, remember to do lots of walking. If you're not catching fish and you haven't been bit in say 10 or 15 minutes, I'm moving on to the next spot. I'm gonna go look for some, some, some different water and different conditions. And then remember, try to stay light, a small backpack, three rods. But the big thing with those three rods is being able, and I think this is the key to this, is fish the top, middle, and bottom water column without having to spend a bunch of time retying lures and doing that type of thing. So that's why I like to have those three rods rigged up. And there'll be times when I may be, you know, using a gotcha or bouncing a slick lure or a grub off the bottom, and all of a sudden some bait fish will blow up and I want to throw a top water at it. Uh, don't have time to sit there and retie something else on for that. Usually it's over by the time you get that done. I can pick up the other rod that has a top water lure, throw it at it real quick and see what happens from there. But it's key to be versatile like that. And once you find those fish, you can key in on those fish uh, by where they're at in the water column. And you know, it may work for you the rest of the day. It may work for you the rest of the time you're down there. Uh, but remember each day I start with that same, that same ideology top to bottom wherever I'm going and I let the fish tell me what they basically what they want uh, what kind of presentation they want and what kind of lures they want guys thanks so much for watching I really appreciate it if you got something out of today's video please consider subscribing to the channel I'll leave some links down in the description below as well for the lures backpack things like that we talked about today and if you have any questions or comments please leave them in the comment section below I love hearing from you guys once again thanks so much for watching and remember until that next video Get out there and fish!